Welcome Welcome to Deep Deck Gonna have a creative conversation Hello there, um, I'm, uh, this is Tape Deck. Welcome to Tape Deck, uh, a podcast where I, um, artist writer Declan Shelby, have a creative conversation, namely with a past or present collaborator in comics. Uh, my collab bro uh, this episode is Ed Brisson. Uh, Ed is a comic book writer who first started to garner attention with his self-published crime series Murder Book. He broke into the public spotlight in 2012 with the crime time travel thriller series Comeback. In the short time since then, he's written and co-created Four other series published by Image, Sheltered, The Field, The Mantle, and The Violent. His self-published series, Murder Book, was collected and released by Dark Horse in early 2015. Ed has also written for DC, Marvel, Boom, IDW, Aftershock, and many others. He's currently writing Batman Incorporated and The Brave and the Bold, Stormwatch for DC, and Predator and Alpha Flight for Marvel. He's been nominated for the Joe Schuster Award for Best Canadian Writer several times. He lives in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, with his wife and daughter. Uh, hello, Ed. I'm going to bring you in. Boom. All right. Hey, how's Nailed it going? It. Yes, not too bad. That's, <laughs> I think I, that's my first time trying to do a proper bio. Right. And, and also, I realize I need to update it because it's a, it's a little bit out of date because uh, Batman Incorporated. You finished, you, you finished Batman Incorporated, didn't you? And, or and that... Brave and the Bold. Yeah. Yeah. And Alpha okay. Flight, I guess. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh. I will. <laughs> Next day, next time, next, next time. Okay. That's my fault. That's not your fault. That's my okay. fault. Okay. All right. There'll be plenty of things that'll be my fault in this. Um, you were nominated for a, um, Best Canadian Writer several times. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's class. I'm like, I'm the uh, like Susan Lucci of that award. Uh, if anyone is old I enough to understand that reference. reference. God damn you. Uh, Susan Lucci was like, a, she was a, like a, a soap opera actress who was nominated for daytime Emmys, I think like 20 times in a row uh, without winning. Uh, so that's me. That's a, yeah, I'm nominated. Uh, I assume she was uh, very, very good. I I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know my mom was a fan. Uh, this was back in the '80s, maybe early '90s, but uh, that's all I can recall. Fair enough. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Like, um, I wanted to, um, I wanted you on one because you know, um, you were one of my favorite writers, and we have both gotten to work together, like kind of and actually, um, and when we actually <laughs> were together. Nobody saw it, and we've kind of worked together, and everyone's seen it. <laughs> like, yes. um, so to so to explain, uh, I've done loads of covers for books that Ed's worked on. Um, I actually I meant to look it up, but I, I t- like you you said to me recently that I've probably done more covers for your books than anybody else. But I was thinking, you definitely um, have. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, uh, I'm tr- I was trying to think. Um, well, obviously we were doing Punisher together, and um, but um, I know I did um, RoboCop, and that was probably one of the early ones. Um, yeah. You did Dead Man, Logan, Dead Man Logan. Logan. Yeah, yeah, it was a good few. Um, I think, did you do any Boom Apes stuff? No, but you did the no, covers for Cluster, or at least at the beginning. That's right, Cluster. Yeah, Boom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's yeah, loads. And now The Displaced, yeah. uh, which yes. is coming out. When's, when's that? We'll get into Valentine's, it later. But, um, Valentine's Day, February 14th. Excellent. A very loving, uh, yes. harrowing <laughs> story. What better way to show your sweetheart that you love them? By giving yeah. them a comic book. Um, well, we get into it anyway. I, I did find, um, I did track down this guy. Uh, so I remember I did these for Boom Studios. You were adapting Frank a Frank Miller screenplay, was it? So the that Robo, one was Robo a Pop. that was a weird one. So that was, um, I think I did issue eight of uh, an eight issue series, and it was Stephen Grant, if I believe, if I if I'm correct, who adapted the Frank Miller screenplay. And the problem was the problem that Boom had is that when he finished adapting the screenplay, it was seven issues okay. and not eight. And okay. so you're like, we need one more issue that can't be a continuation because that story's done. So mm. they weirdly just brought me in at the end to write a standalone uh, old school uh, Robocop story that could sort of follow up the book that had been done, but was not necessarily. Uh, not even necessarily an epilogue. It was just like a standalone tale that came at the end. Was it weird uh, to, the, to take like that kind of like the material that was there? And I mean, like, yeah, what do you have to move it around and twist it or change certain kind of um, climaxes or how, how did you do that? No, no, it's just like it was just me doing a one shot, right? I, I wasn't really tied to oh, anything. Okay. That they just done to, just to wrap it up. Kinda. Just wasn't even wrapping it up. It was just like just a standalone. <laughs> 
that they published at the end. Uh, so it was really it was a bizarre thing. It was I think one of my very first work for hire gigs. So this would have been like 2013, I think. Um, maybe 2014, I can't recall. But yeah, it was okay. it was just a weird so- thing where they they didn't know what they needed. They just needed something to fill that last issue because they needed to uh, have it break evenly into four issue trade paperbacks. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I was, well, was really there to fill it out. It was, fu- it was fun for me because I got to do a kind of a connecting cover thing. So like I tried to do like a really cool first cover and then have them connect mm-hmm. as we went through. So it's one of, I've only, that's really the only time I've done it. This is very patchy put together now, but, you, but it also was kind of weird because I had, I, I did, wasn't able to do the whole thing at one go. So I was kind of um, drawing the cover and having it come off the edge and then try and connect it afterwards rather than if right. I just did one perfect image and then, you know, but um, so it was a bit of a mess, but it was also a fun challenge. And um, uh, that was, yeah, that was really, I mean, it was, it was cool seeing you do a book like that because I think, like I said, it was one of your first work for higher ones. And had you done comeback by then, had you? I think we, I'd already done comeback. So that was like sort of comeback was my first published work anywhere. So it was 20 November, 2012 that came out. Um, okay. And then I think in the following year, I ended up doing uh, Robocop, two different Robocop. So like the, the old school Robocop and then the new one, that new movie came out, which might've been a year oh, or so nice, later. Yeah. Uh, I did a one shot for that, and then I was at uh, Sun. I was on Sons of Anarchy for Boom for because you had a while on that, didn't you? It wasn't just a mini series, was it? Yeah, I think I did twelve that? issues. So I came in. There was a six issue run before me, written by Christopher Golden, uh, art by Damian Gazzaro, who I I've worked with a bunch sure uh, over the years. Um, so I came in at issue seven, and I was originally just supposed to do a one shot, and then Boom put me on it full time uh, to do. So I went from issue seven up until 20, no, 19, I guess. I can't remember. I, I did it for like a full 12 issues, I think. And at that point, I felt like I Was that of, like a cool gig though? Like you knew you had some issues to work with and, you know, from start, like from starting out as a, you know, your as a work for hire gig, like that was probably the first one you really got to kind of like do some writing rather than Robocop, which is a bit of a, a patch job, like. For, for lack yeah, of a no, phrase. Yeah, it was uh, it was great. I uh, so when I was starting out, you know, I was trying to before comeback, I was always trying to pitch crime stuff, and I think you and I first met uh, email wise anyway during that period because I think you and I met about two years before I did comeback, uh, and I was always trying to pitch crime stuff and never getting it through, and um, I was developing at one point a, a pitch for a book called The One Percenters that was a biker book. Hmm. And uh, I had done a ton of like research on bikers uh, uh, and, you know, <clears throat> I don't know how many books I've read, way too many books on it, you know, and, and about like the sort of early days of the Hells Angels and that sort of stuff. Um, and like where I grew up in Oshawa was one of the first um, Hells Angels clubhouses in Canada w- was there. So, you know, they were around when I was growing up. My dad was a cop for years and had, you know, uh, biker run ins. So I had been building this this thing called the One Percenters, and then I decided to watch the Sons of Anarchy just to see, you know, <clears throat> it's that thing, I'm sure you run into this too, where you're creating something and you realize there's this other thing out there that is a, in a similar space. And you have to make that decision whether or not you go and watch or read or, or take in that thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because you don't want to veer too close. You don't want to just duplicate what someone else is doing. You don't want to come across like a ripoff. So when Sons of Anarchy came out, I sat down and I watched the first two seasons and then I just threw away the pitch for the one percent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so much of it was just exactly or very similar. Anyway, did, did your and, story go to, to Ireland as like the show? Because that's when I stopped watching. I did, I did go to Ireland. Um, <laughs> there were no bad Irish accents uh, in my comic. Uh, mm-hmm. Which, like, you know, I, I enjoyed all the Sons of Anarchy, uh, but I'll say I'm actually terrible for recognizing, uh, you know, when people complain about someone's bad accent, I can never pick them up. I'm just like, it sounds fine to me, except for Sons of Anarchy season two, where I'm like, nobody <laughs> in the <this> show 
sales Irish. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember. Anyway. Even there's one actress. Uh, there's one actress from um, Deadwood. I can't think of her name, but I think she actually is from Ireland, and even her accent seemed weird. But anyway, that, yeah, that was a long Oof. time ago, and it's not quite related. But um, but no, you, you mentioned yeah, we we started talking. I remember um, because like the way you kind of started out is the way I always tell if any if any writer is looking to kind of break in. I for years I would just tell them what you did. Which was I found I think if I recall right it was Andy Diggle tweeted I don't know why I remember this I I, I forget past parts huge parts of my life but I remember these little tiny stories um, Andy Diggle I think shared your work and you had these really short shorts like you had these short stories like six pages whatever they were and there, it was a murder book and they were on your website and I could just read the short story and then there was another one by a different artist and I could read that and they were all vaguely connected but they were all you know self-contained shorts and i just became a fan straight away because these were really nice tight crime stories um i was, I was able to read a chunk of them and just got into your stuff straight away and um you know i was big into criminal and all the brubaker phillips stuff and um i just thought like this is really really cool and i think i think i might have reached out to you because yeah of you you yeah. did. I think that's how we met is you sent me an email sometime in 2010. And uh, yeah, you and I talked a bit. And I think at, at that point we talked about the possibility of doing a murder book story together. Hmm. And then I think like I, in the month that I was like writing it, you got hired by Marvel and you were yeah, just Yeah, that sounds like, about right. And then everything. Was <laughs> yeah. And, and you were just gone. And who? <laughs> uh, although, you know, the, the great, the, the funny thing about that or, or the interesting thing about that is I had written this story and uh, you were going off to do the Marvel stuff and that same month. So I used to letter comic books, which I don't know how many people uh, are that's aware right. of that. Actually, but that's- yeah, that was, that was another thing I'd said to, to people as well, because you had lettered your, your own work and that way you were my argument to people starting out was if you're if you're able to letter that helps you with your writing, you know, but also it means you can just kind of like materialize your own projects and you're not. Dependent yeah, you can on... definitely save money putting things together. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I had been lettering stuff, and uh, Michael Walsh hired me to letter a pitch he had that was going out to Image called Delta, I think it was called. And I really liked his artwork. And you know, as as uh, we were finishing up on the, that pitch, I had offered that instead of him paying me uh, for the lettering work I had done, that I, I sent him the script that I think I'd originally written when you and I were talking, I was like, I just need, I need an artist for this script. Would you like to work on it? And maybe like, if you can give me like, you know, whatever your rate is less, what my lettering rate is. And I wouldn't charge sure. you for lettering. And, and uh, yeah, Walsh liked it and I read it and really liked it. And that's kind of when he and I started working together. Uh, okay. So right. you getting hired at Marvel was kind of serendipitous because then it, it ended up, uh, leading to this other thing, uh, which was great. It is funny sometimes how it, I, I think it's something Jeff Parker mentioned before when we were talking was that, um, you know, y- you can get opportunities come up when other people mess up, you know, right. uh, that was, he was saying that's kind of how he got a lot of jobs. So somebody else made a mistake. So then he was around, but like, um, yeah, it goes to show you like some doors close in your face, but then there's a whole other opportunity there. I mean, whatever happened to that Michael Walsh guy anyway. Yeah. Who knows? Knows? <laughs> I haven't heard from him for years. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and that's actually like how when I was lettering comic books, I was working for, you know, publishers and doing a lot of image stuff. And the majority of the work I got was uh, back then I was the guy who could turn around a book in a day. And so anytime like other, you know, it, it's incredible, you know, I'm not that incredible if you've worked in the industry long enough, but every so often, you know, people just vanish. They're just like they're working on mm-hmm. your book and then all of a sudden they're just not there anymore and because it's like you're only in contact with people through email generally you can't just go no, knock you can't go the knock on their door or anything <laughs> so i end up getting a lot of lettering work by like uh by just being the guy who could actually handle when someone when a letter just disappeared which happened you know more often than you would think back then um but yeah it was, was you know it was just a way for me to meet it was a great way like lettering if you could actually you know, it was a great backdoor for me into the industry because I got to yeah, meet I was going to a say, lot did of you, Did you kind of get a lot of contacts with editors and stuff like that that you wouldn't have gotten? I, I did get some contacts with editors, um, but uh, like I don't talk about this a ton, but um, 
I think like, uh, and you know me long enough probably to, to know that this is true, that I, I could be an incredibly anxious person. And so when I was lettering, even though I would deal with editors, you know, every day through my work, if I went to a convention and I had a pitch um, in my hand that I wanted to show to editors, like I can specifically remember being at Emerald City, I think in 2012 or 2011, and, you know, I was sat across from the Oni booth and I'd lettered a, a shit ton of Oni books. And I'm looking at James Lucas Jones and, and Charlie Chu, who are sitting there, who I've exchanged 100 emails with these guys. And I'm like gripping this pitch in my hand and I couldn't. I had four days or whatever the convention was, and I couldn't steal myself enough to walk over there and just hand them the pitch. Right. Um so, like, I did have these contacts, and I, I won't lie, I know it did help me in some regards for getting into the industry. <laughs> just to be known but for being maybe professional. Maybe not as like, much. Right. Yeah, but even just, you know, I, like, because I, I found, you know, I think, um, you know, I'm not saying it's easier being a colorist or a letter or whatever, but just by the nature of the projects, they come faster. Like, you do, you, your network expands much, much faster. You can work on a right. book as an artist. And you know one writer and one like you can just really be you know two people, but the, those other jobs you can really expand your your contact list as it were you know um, which not to say you're just going to start pitching stuff straight away, but it, it couldn't hurt to build up a little bit of familiarity and to make it easier for when you eventually would yeah go, absolutely you know. and um, you know it did it did make it easier down the line you know I had talked to Oni about doing projects you know and so it did make it easier and it did like. You're right. Like, you know, when I was lettering, there were some months where I would letter 10, 12 books, right? So you would think that's like 10 different uh, artists I'm having contact with. And, you know, hopefully just as many writers, sometimes less, obviously, because some writers are working on multiple books. But yeah, it definitely did help uh, expand. But I don't, uh, before that had been self-published, like I originally wanted to be a writer, or sorry, an artist, not a writer. And so I'd been self-publishing for years, like since the mid-90s writing and drawing and lettering and coloring and releasing all my own stuff. So I, I already knew a bunch of people. Like when I started Murder Book, it was a lot of the original artists were friends of mine, like people yeah. I went and drank beer with and stuff like that. So it was uh, – So what, what made you decide to do that in the first place? Like so, so by the time I found your stuff, you were still like starting out, you know, uh, like I was at the time. Um, and I think I, I just I just liked what you were doing. I thought that would be that would be a cool thing to do. But I mean, you had already done it by then. What gave you the impetus to go like, I'm going to do this and put it on my website and have it all kind of presentable there for anybody to read? Uh, the plan was uh, the the hope was that like I'd been self publishing, like I said for I started Murder Book in 2010, so at that point I'd been self publishing for 16 years, and. I just, I didn't want, I wanted someone else to publish me. And I knew mm. that writers couldn't get a, um, like you can't get a portfolio in front of an editor the same way that an artist can. An artist, you can, you show up with like, I don't know what it is normally, like 10 pieces or something that you would show to an editor uh, in your large portfolio. And so my thought process was if I can distill my writing down to very short, uh, punchy, and easily digestible chunks that are are full stories that aren't like, you know, like hire me if you want to see how this story continues. Like it's giving someone a full experience in five pages and six pages or whatever it is. Then I knew I could probably get those in front of editors Mm -hmm. and get them to read them because it's not a large time commitment. And then hopefully if I've done my job, you know, I'm, 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 showing my skill set there, showing what I can do as a writer. And I found that it worked out well. And what I was doing is, like I said, I wanted to break into the industry. I wanted someone to hire me. I was done uh, photocopying comics and selling them out of record shops in my backpack. And so I um, <clears throat> was doing those and just sort of sending them out. And I, I took from the first year that I started doing them. I had pitched some books before without any success. My plan was just to do these for a year, put out as many as I can, and just focus on the story and not on on pitching to publishers. Yeah. And just sort of like show that I could do this work, like put the proof out there. And my idea behind making them free online was 
the like the Andy Diggle thing, how you and I met was like it was a, a really weird sort of uh, situation that I don't know could be duplicated because it was early days of Twitter. People were still very excited about it. People weren't mm. all assholes. And, yeah, people um, were sharing stuff, and I mean, the yes. spirit was much more. Hey, we're all doing stuff, and hey, check this yeah, out. It's absolutely. not like, yeah. And I think it was like somebody he was had posted on Twitter one night that he was just looking for stuff to read, and somebody uh, uh, sent him a link, like posted a link to uh, Murder Book, and then he read it and he retweeted it and said, "Hey, this comic's really great. You should check it out." And I think I got like, <clears throat> I can't remember. Like ten thousand hits on the comic that night, and then like fifty or sixty thousand the next day, because it went from Andy Diggle to then somebody on Reddit saw it, and then they reposted mm-hmm. it, and just kind of spread around from there. And that really helped, like, kind of just get my name out there a little bit more. Uh, I wasn't well, expecting well, you, it. You at built all. a portfolio, like you like you said, it's hard as a yeah. writer to have a portfolio. You basically presented one. You know, it's just not <laughs> and, single images. It's it's short stories, you know. Absolutely. Page, and, you know. and my hope there and what and what ended up working was that if I posted these online for free and not doing the thing where like some people do a page a week, if I'm giving everyone just a complete story all read at once, and then when I'm ready with the next story, that complete story goes up, then at least uh, people will like hopefully retain it, remember it, and then spread around, uh, you know, spread the word, which which is exactly what happened. And yeah. oddly, that constantly just led to me getting more and more work down the line. I got a comment here from uh, Gary Maloney, who just had a book announced this week, actually. Um, uh, it's not crime, but, you know, will allow us. Uh, but congratulations to Gary. Um, but he's asked, he says, I think there's something about crime stories that lend themselves to short form narratives and satisfying vi- vignette. I can't say that word. Vignettes. Vignettes. Uh, then there we go. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I mean there's a lot of anthologies that have been crime anthologies, probably for that reason. I don't know. I mean, there was I was never read like the murder book stories and was like, ah, oh, no, this, they were satisfying. I mean, they, I guess you set up, you know, the premise and then the hook. You know, someone gets screwed over or what have you. But like, did you think it, yeah, it worked particularly it, well for crime, for shorts? I think so because I think you know, <clears throat> it's not the stakes aren't world ending like they are in like most comics. They're generally very personal, very small stakes, but uh, they're not necessarily small to the person. They're high stakes to that person. Sure. But mm-hmm. because they're more personal, you can you can kind of shrink it down and, and make it, you know, like a two person play almost or, or, or whatever it is. You don't necessarily need a ton of real estate to show how the world is, uh, you know, reacting to some mega mind villain, you know, who's threatening to shut, you know, to power up nuclear reactors or whatever, whatever fuck it is. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. Like you can just make like the very first story was really just about two friends who hadn't seen each other running into one another uh, after having not seen each other for about four or five years. And, and it turns out that one of the guys is sort of like a, is a hitman who's undercover but his friend doesn't know, and he's trying to he's trying to keep the secret safe by doing all these really sort of shady stuff. So it's a really small. I think that one was eleven pages. But yeah, I think if you can just dial it down to like one event, uh, you know, and start right at at that moment, and then get out real quick, uh, you can get something uh, really special. It's harder. I think it is probably harder to do with sci fi or or fantasy. Even horror, you know, horror is kind of tough to pull off sometimes. Uh, in, in short, I mean, like 2018 like built its back off short sci-fi concepts, but they are more. Um, they require way, way more like world building and trying to fit it right. all into six pages and all that. I mean, I think the advantage of doing like a crime story is you can just, I mean, from as from an artist's point of view as well, like you can just do some lovely moody stuff. You know, guy walking down the street holding a gun is just a cool image. Um, yes. you know, uh, like, and it hits easy, a bit, a bit, a bit more kind of sharper than like a big sci-fi, you know, environment. Um, uh, I mean, I just love the format, and I, I know you, you and I have talked a good few times about like, you know, I wish the crime stuff sold better because I remember, I remember, I found an old Wizard magazine, and it was like the the big crime writers of comics, and it was, um, it was Brubaker and Bendis and um, 
uh, Greg Rucka Rucka. and like, yeah, yeah, like all these guys who end up doing like, you know, then within two years, they were doing all the big superhero comics. And I can see why crime comics lend to superheroes quite easily, you know? Um, And I was just, I was getting frustrated because I'm like, this is where they should be looking. They should look at the crime guys. Um, But it is very frustrating when the actual crime stuff doesn't, I can't say it doesn't hit because like Brubaker and Phillips clearly have huge success, but, but like it is quite limited to them. You know, not not, yes. not having go with them at all. It's just you'd think with like such success in one genre, people would try out that more of that genre, but they just try out those creators specifically. Yeah, you would hope, and like it's even like um, you know, one of my favorite series is Stray Bullets, uh, yeah. which is an incredible series, and uh, I know that like it came back. Uh, Image brought it back. Uh, how many years ago was that? Now, and even that one kind of struggled to get a, a fan base. It's, I think that the people who like it, love it. It's just, mm. it's just got such a niche following that it's hard to attract as many people as you need to in order to keep it going. And that doesn't mean I, I stop trying. I keep trying to pitch uh, crime stuff repeatedly to publishers, but it's such a, it's such a hard. Yeah. Like that, that last a, book at AWA. Life. Sorry. What was it called again? Um, Sins um, of the Salton Sea. Yeah. I mean, with uh, C.P. Smith, isn't it? Um, is it the artist's name, isn't it? C.P. Smith, yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Savage. like, sa- And it's great to just read. Like, sometimes you might feel like you have to kind of, like, do a crime comic in the back end of a, you know, sci-fi or something. But, like, that was just, um, like, it's just nice to read a crime book, you know? Um, without that was like- a crime book until it wasn't, though, because we did well, catch it as a horror thing, I guess. Uh, towards the back end. Uh, well, look at the same thing. I did Bog Bodies, and I I wrote that as a crime story, and then it was the editor who said like, "This is actually horror." I'm like, "No, no, I'm not really, I'm not really into writing horror." Right. And then I kind of looked at him like, "Oh, actually, yeah, kind of, kind of a ghost story, you know, which, which completely didn't mean to do. I was to me, I was just writing a straight crime story, you know." Yeah, I hear you. No, it's. Uh, I think those two things work, you know, work together quite well, though. Uh, they sort of trade on the same uh, fears, the same. Uh, <clears throat> same sort of in, uh, storytelling instincts so you know it's, well, it's I, easy I, to, to probably one to the other I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you more about um, uh, Crime Get 2 uh, Displaced but um, I did want to show so so it didn't work out a murder book because I got Marvel work and then I, I um, paid attention to myself um, but we did come back a few years later when murder it was Dark Horse approached you to publish murder book wasn't it yeah so they wanted to do a collection of murder book and to help fill out the collection, they wanted to do four new stories that would run first in Dark Horse Presents, and oh, then be right. collected and put into the collection. Which and, which worked because uh, then you got to have an actual book. But I remember that then you got back onto me, or I, I, I think yeah, you reached out to me asked if I still want to do one. Yes. Um, yeah. I think I was pretty uh, insistent. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to too because also I think. I can't remember when around went that when, but like the cool thing about Marvel was getting to do big books and or you know big books. Thunderbolts was like a small Marvel book, admittedly, but um, I'd love the crime genre and didn't really get to do that much stuff. So it was fun for me to just do it. But um, I am, um, I've got some of the the script here. Uh, you were kind enough to send it on to me. Um, and I was looking. You have an. I'm going to show us another script of yours that's more recent, but um, the format is similar, but it looks like you kind of change up how you do your how you you format your scripts. Did that come from doing more professional? Because you've done a good bit of professional work by, by, by now. Did something change? It's, uh, it's been, uh, it's a few things. Uh, one is um, I change it based on, I think I, I started adding at the top of the page where it says page one. Now I'll add like the panel count uh, for the right, entire yeah. page. And that came, I think Walsh got on my case about that. Um, <clears throat> about not knowing how many panels there needs to be when you can just like looking at the top of the page. So I started doing that probably not too long after uh, we did this uh, murder book story. And then now just in the last year, I've started rather than adding, you know, I, I still add it into the script, but to make it easier for the colorist, I'll add like the time of day right at the top too. Yeah. Um, so this is for um, Alpha Flight issue one which is, so we're talking like nearly like nine years later on. And yes. I mean, you even have bits highlighted. You have um, the formatting is a little bit more spaced out. Um, so those highlights. Time, time te- Sorry, go on. Oh, go ahead. 
after you. Uh, well, uh, yeah, just because um, the time of day thing as well, I know a lot of people, a lot of colors specifically kind of called that out. And I think that's probably, if I have a problem with that too, I have to remind myself to to do that. Yeah, it's uh, it's something I just did in the last year. And it might have been from talking to colors, I can't recall, or listening to a colorist who was talking online about it. And I'm like, well, this is like an easy fix, right? For writers, we can just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. just pop no, it in there. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> um, this is impossible. <laughs> but it's just to make everyone's you know life and job a little bit easier. Um, the highlighting in here is, uh, you can see up at the top, I think it says third draft there. So what I typically do is I, I absolutely hate track changes. Yeah, me you know, too. I just hate the way it looks. And so when I go through a script and I make changes from one draft to the other, uh, if okay. it's just a small change like like I had done there, I'd probably just added a bit of extra information. I'll just highlight mm -hmm. it so the editor knows what to look at. And sometimes well, so you if probably I've changed, wouldn't. You wouldn't think to look for us for like one line. You'd if you see a script two or three times. In my experience, an extra line you're not even going to see it unless it's pointed out to you. Yeah. So yeah, that's why I highlight that. And if I'm doing like the entire page, so if I uh, sometimes you know I'll cut a page and, and put drop in a new page or whatever. I'll just highlight the the page header just so that the editor knows this entire page has probably been changed. Uh, I don't know how much of that we have in that script, but uh, and you're like you're pretty good for um, visual references as well. And uh, like yeah, even I, forget I love I love to just drop in a ton of references. Uh, the problem with that is sometimes I'll send off a script and the script like is a word document that's 25 megabytes for whatever reason, and so it can't go through Gmail. Um, but I, again, it's just another thing to make everyone's life easier. Like if I have a specific setting, I'm just going to send you photos of it. And usually I'll include a link if it, there's a Google Street document. Again, just with character designs and stuff like that. No, uh, I mean, it, from an artist's point of view, it does help just to have something to start from. You know, just even if it's very basic, you know where you're, you're not going to go with that exactly, but just knowing where to start from just really mm -hmm. does cut out a lot of like, you know, mental strain. Um, but um, yeah, would you say there's much differences other than that since like in the I years? Think other, other than that, I think I just, I number my dialogue now, which I never used to. Uh, and I think that just came from, um, I think when I was working on uh, an IDW book, that was something they required. And then the only other thing really is I, there, you'll notice there's more space between the end of each panel description. I put an extra space in there where if you look back at our, murder book one there was just one space and then i continue on and that i think came from early days on marvel where it might have been axel who sort of hammered that into my head uh and i switched from using courier to times no real reason i just prefer using times um there are some editors who hate it and will just switch the script back to courier but uh i don't know i find it i, I, I go with Hel helvetica um I, for a similar thing, just kind of um, like this is harder to read the murder book one because it is, it's like I had the same problem too. I remember I, I did a, I was doing something for Marvel and I saw Jordan White complain about formatting, and then I think I got an email from Heather Antos, who was his assistant at the time, uh, suggesting how to format it. And I realized, oh, that was me. He was complaining about, right. <laughs> you know, but because oh, I was, was awesome I was learning. Out. I, I was learning on the fly, you know, I didn't like word talk. Ugh. Um, Ugh. So I, I've definitely refined it since, but I, I do, you know, I, I like, like if I can, I like to keep a script page into a page. You can't always do it, yeah. but I try and, you know, and I try and like, like you say, space it out because if you are an artist reading this stuff, it can all blur together sometimes. And it's really hard to just, you know, separate yeah, you it wanna, out. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I, another reason I switched from Courier, and this is sort of a dumb reason, but it's a hang-up of mine, is I used to work in, um, uh, like I was a creative director for a health and safety organization, and so I designed uh, posters and documents uh, and a lot of stuff that I would send off to print. And Courier is the default uh, font if you've screwed up and not outlined or included your fonts with your print files. So if okay. you don't include your font when you send a, a thing off to file, a lot of uh, programs, at least back when I was working, would just default to Courier. So when Courier, like if I got a thing back from the printer and it was in Courier, that meant I fucked up somewhere along the way. And so I still have that weird knee-jerk reaction to uh, to the font, and that's why I think I moved away from it. And uh, would your years of lettering have informed 
I mean, it's weird, like you say, you do the, the numbering. I, I don't number the dialogue myself because um, <clears throat> sometimes it can be confusing. Is your FX, do you, like, is SFX numbered? I number everything. If it's if it's text that the letterer has to put in there, then I letter it. Um, and that was like, I think at the time was just like an IDW thing. I, it's a thing where I could probably drop it out, but it's just so ingrained at this point that I just keep it in. Fair enough. But but like, so from a lettering point of view, I know you don't letter anymore, but do you think that would have helped you when you were lettering? I don't think uh, that much. Like, it helps to know which order it's supposed to go in, perhaps, but it's mm. already kind of in that order. I think it it's originally intended to help the artist more when they're doing their layout so they can just, you know, drop in the balloons and the layouts with the numbers for yeah, each bit of, of dialogue. I mean, I, I'm a proponent of the num, um, numbering the panels on the top as well, um, mainly because I find I found that like like if I was reading this right this script, I'd be like, oh, panel one, panel two, panel three. Now it does say continue to the bottom, but in my mind, that first panel is probably going to be the biggest one because you've got more right. going on there. And so I've already created it's probably going to be like most of the of the page, and then I've got two more smaller panels. Cool, that page is going to. Ah, crap, there's three more. You know? <laughs> so even though, yeah, to yeah. be fair, you have down continued, it's 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 your brain kind of gets ahead of you sometimes. Um, sure. You don't know how to pace the page, basically. You know, you kind of, you, you don't know where you're jumping in or where to hold back. So it, at least if I know there's like, if there was six on top of that, my brain will pace it better. All of a sudden, that first panel is way smaller, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then oh, I'll really? realize, oh, maybe I'll, you know, that's, that, that's why I've, said to people that I, I like that in the scripts I get, but I mean, um, uh, that's just me. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say you have to do it, but it's, I definitely prefer it myself. Um, I think it's easier. Um, but I, I, it's funny. I, ro- I wrote something for Gavin Guidry uh, about a year or so ago. And it was a, I wrote a two back to back pages that were, I think 12, 14 and 12 panels. And I know as an artist, you probably open that up and get like a heart attack. <laughs> so like before panel one, I had just this very long apology and just sort of like, here, here's what it is and here's why I think it works and why I think we need this many panels. And those pa- those pages came out great. It was like, it was a chase scene and rather than just two dudes running through an alley, I wanted just quick moments of like their feet, uh, them landing on the ground or them cutting their eyes when, you know, one way. So it was all very close up, small panels, but... No, I think that's good though because you... you, you... You laid the groundwork for that with what you said. You know, if 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 you had didn't have that in there, I think Gavin would have just read the scripts. He'd be like, "Oh man, I'm going to fit all this in here." But if you explain where you're going with it, you're like, "Oh right, okay." I, I you know, I yeah. don't think anybody ever has a problem with that. It's trying to figure out what the person's looking for if it's not down there. Um, and like, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like getting too verbose with like descriptions and things. I try and be as lean as I can. I mean, this is a pretty lean script. I mean, yeah, I think you know, I, I tend to be a lot of times more verbose on my like opening, like establishing panels if we're like in a new location and, and such. But once we're kind of in that location, then you don't need to lay that out. And it, it depends how specific I need it. Right. Like if I, if we're in a fast food restaurant for like I, I just handed off a script that has a scene in a fast food restaurant. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing what the fast food restaurant looks like. Instead, mm-hmm. I'm just going to send you photos of Burger King and just be like, they're in a place called Queen Burger and it's our universe's version of Burger King. Here's what it looks like. Because, uh, that you know, you don't need all that description. The, the photo is going to, you know, the photo reference. Is well, gonna, yeah, I mean, yeah, because you have photos evidence. in there, too, that, that does a lot of the basic work, too. You know, like, uh, you know, your, your scripts aren't. It's a fine Saturday evening. The, you know, the air is crisp and, you know, like, uh-huh. I've gotten scripts like that. And you're like, oh, for God's sake. Just show me a photo. <laughs> um, I'm trying to see what I did do with that page. Uh, so, yeah, so that's the same page. So even though you explain, explained a lot in the first panel, it doesn't really take up that much space. But, right. you know, I clearly went with that. But like, I think that was, that was our first. Same page. No, no, that was, but that was our first uh, panel going into that room, right? So yeah, a lot of that yeah, stuff yeah. in the first uh, panel description is meant to kind of serve the rest of the scene rather than strictly that that first panel uh, hmm. i love yeah, the i think you sometimes you, you you can see a lot of text in the script and you're like oh god no and then you read you're like oh yeah this is just helping it's not it's not like you need to mm-hmm. draw ev- everything every single sentence is something you need to draw it's just trying to help you 
um, figure it out. I mean, I knew I knew I was going to use lots of shadow because it's I you know want to be dark, but um, I mean, mm. I haven't actually looked at this in 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 years. But um, it was just really cool to do a crime story. Nobody's jumping through walls or anything. It was all it was all mood. Oh, and yeah, and you still use um. There's a face from this you use in your Twitter bio. Yeah, yeah. I use it as my avatar. Um, I don't know. Go forward one more page, I think. Or... Yeah, I think it's... There it is. Yeah. Up yeah, at yeah, the yeah. top right hand. Yeah. I figured back then I didn't have a beard. He looked enough like me. I think... <laughs> I don't know if it's still my... Um, yeah, it's still my Twitter. So it's probably been my Twitter thing for like 10 years. You don't need me to go in and draw a beard on it to, to update it now. <laughs> I think there's a version. At one point, I did draw like a cartoony beard on it just for fun. Uh, and color it <laughs> yeah. Like but yeah, I use it. It's uh, actually, I was just uh, playing PlayStation earlier, and it's actually my PlayStation uh, avatar as well. So uh, yeah, Chris Somney took a childhood photo of me and drew a little like goatee on it. Uh, and it's still, actually, it is. It's my YouTube iconic and it's actually looking right at me. Nice. Um, but, uh, but no, it was really fun to work on this, man. Like, I mean, I, I like, I, I, I love your stuff and I I was like right. an advocate for you when, you know, I was breaking in and, you know, I wasn't really in the position to kind of like suggest people. But if anybody was ever asking, I was just like, oh, there's this guy, Ed Person, he's great. Like, you know, um, so it was, felt really cool that, you know, Murder Book was doing well enough that you could collect it and do more stories. So it just felt like it was really cool to have it all to come together like this, you know? No, I appreciate it. And I like, for me, it was just great. Like, like I said, we you know, had talked at one point of working together in 2010 and to mm. actually get that opportunity in 2014, this came out or 2014, we, this was drawn. I think it came out in 2015, but uh, mm. yeah, you know, cause obviously uh, a huge fan of your work and had been, uh, had been trying to figure out a way uh, to work together on something that, uh, that yeah, the world could see. I'm yeah, not going to take a later uh, collaboration. <laughs> Well, I mean, so yeah, so look, I figured I'd show some the Punisher stuff because no one's seen it. Um, I probably no one ever will. So I thought since we're talking, because that was, yeah, 2014. So what was it? 2000 and, 2018? I think, I think I, like, I wrote the first Punisher script, I think late 2017. Right. And for one for one reason or another things i think kept getting pushed back a little bit um, you know that was, that was, that was on me and um, me and um jordy belair were in a relationship for a long time we broke up and i was just kind of just a bit i wasn't really quite together and marvel this came together but then marvel kept kind of giving me like one shots and stuff to do that there was right. more time time sensitive basically so they've been really good to me to give me time so i'm like cool I, you know i'll like it was, it was like Wolverine and there was Fantastic Four and stuff. So I think it was, but I think a large part of it too was that um, Matt Rosenberg was on a Punisher th thing at the time that I right. think was originally intended to not go on for as long as it, it did. And it, it did well. So it, it kept going for a while. And so the need for this one, they just kept kind of pushing it back. Mm. And it was going to be, I think when Matt's Punisher run ended, this is when ours was going to launch. And so, his is doing well enough that ours kind of get getting yeah. Ours started under Axel. I remember we were talking to him at the first. Yes, and then he he was. Yeah, there's absolutely. If Axel wasn't there, there's we would not have gotten away with any of the stuff that's in that book. Uh, well, I then, think that, well, that, well, also we kind of didn't. <laughs> anyway, we didn't I, yeah, ultimately we didn't. <laughs> and I, like I think about that a lot about how when I would talk about it in inter interviews about Punisher because. Uh, I don't know how many people know, but Punisher was supposed to come out in April 2020, and it was due to come out the first week that Diamond shut down. Yeah, uh, I think I think it was printed. Like I think I, I, it didn't I have to the copies, but there's no way it wasn't printed because Diamond <laughs> shut down on whatever day it was, and it was like literally days before the book was supposed to come out. So there's no way it would not have been printed because it it takes you know, two weeks or something like that to yeah, work yeah. its way from the printer through the system to the stores. So it definitely was printed. Um, but yeah, I, I kicked myself because I remember doing press and repeatedly just saying, like, I can't believe Marvel let us get away with the stuff, some of the stuff in here. And I, I read the first two issues yesterday because, uh, you know, we got a PDF 
that the digital version of the first and yeah. then of the first two that were sent out to uh, you know the Marvel uh, Marvel has sort of a um, a system where they would send out PDFs to other writers and artists who are working on Marvel books. And I read through it and I like I really enjoy it. I like I'm still really upset that it never came out because I I think it's really good. I like I think it's like the most it's probably next to Bullseye the most like me thing I've ever written at Marvel. Mm. Uh so it's always a pisser that it that it's just sitting on a shelf somewhere. Uh, that was but, yeah, to me also, it was like, okay, we, we get to do a crime book. We get to do uh, a crime book. I, at Marvel, we get paid Marvel rates to do a crime book. That was what was cool for me, and you know, like getting to work with you was great because it felt like, and not to sound like an asshole, although I will sound like an asshole saying this, was you were at a level where me working with you wouldn't hurt me, which it's a, it's a very it's a very careerist thing to say. But sure. my, what I mean okay, is yeah. that is that like the way you wear, wake your way, wake, work your way up as an artist is to like latch on to bigger people. And I had like worked with big people and I, I did really, really well. And you were working your way up. So by the time where you you were doing really big books at Marvel and I was, we were at the same level basically. So it was easy to work with you where it, where it wouldn't be like, it feel like I'm, um, you know, I'm working with somebody who's not going to like bring me up. Because that's always been my strategy is I'll, work, I'll always drag you down. bring you up, you know. I'll no, was, well, you <laughs> well, you would have before, you know. I mean, just because I'm just so, <laughs> you know, I, like, it's 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 very careerist thing to say, but like, sure, sure. if I'm being honest, that was it was in the back of my mind, you know. So when this came up, I'm like, this is perfect because like Ed's Ed's always done good stuff, but he's at a level now where, you know, people are going to be excited to read this, and if I'm drawing it too, it just kind of, I just felt like the two of us, it was, it was just, I don't know, the timing was great. The book was perfect. I was really, really happy. There were some derails, you know, with the schedule and whatnot, but I, you know, and as well, I remember I was really um, psyched, overwhelmed because I just, I had done a really good run of covers on Punisher, mm. um, the Becky Cloonan and um, Steve Dillon one. And I'm like, crap, I think I did, I can't really beat that. <laughs> and now I'm doing a Punisher book that I'm drawing and I can't think of anything better. But in the end, I came up with this kind of noirish. Um, you like very design heavy approach, which I mean, actually, I think there's some of the favorite covers I've done that have never been published. Um, but I, so I just felt like we had this really, and also like you, we talked about setting in Miami. And at first I was like, oh man, I would, you know, I'd like to draw like New York or, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. But then once I did some research and stuff, I'm like, no, no, Miami's great. Cause you like, it's bright, but it's like, you know, neon and And dark dark shadow and there's such actually an advantage visual advantage to doing it there and i think that came from axel i feel like it was axel who wanted to sit at miami Um, okay i could be wrong on that uh but i believe it that that came from axel and in the end it worked out well i think like we have like a lot of like neon bits and stuff throughout the series that but works really well because the subject matter is quite dark uh, yeah, but yeah. we're juxtaposing it with these, like, you know, uh, that panda. What was it? The panda Pete's pizza. That's right. Parlor. Yeah. What oh, the oh, hell oh, was the oh, place oh, called? Um, I have it in an image remember. here. I, I, right. I, I can't remember. But I, yeah, it was basically a Chuck E. Cheese type thing, which I wasn't really yeah. familiar with. I, I only know them from American references. We didn't really have that here. So, yeah, that was, I mean, yeah, it was my, like there's some. I mean, people have no idea like how not. I've told a few people who've asked in private, like what Barracuda does in this, and they're like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, uh, it's so cool," <laughs> like, you know. Um, but I was, I'm, but then I was like, I got really annoyed, um, just before the book came out because Marvel decided to do different covers, have somebody else do the main covers to this, and right. make these covers B covers, and. I was really, really pissed off about it. Like, I'm not saying I'm glad the book wasn't published. <laughs> I was that annoyed. Right. Um, but I was like, I was like, it felt like the temperature had changed. Well, clearly it had. The temperature changed yeah. while we worked on the book. So while my approach was we were doing a really cool noirish crime book, you know, not Marvel Max, but very much Max in spirit. But I don't really think the publisher really knew what to do. Well, that's not fair because it was coming out, but COVID just kind of... You know, yeah, COVID derailed it. And yeah, I think there was a lot, like, I wonder, there was like some concerns as well at the time uh, 
for like some of the stuff like that w- was in the book, like unfortunate timing uh, when put up against like actual real life events that were going on. Hmm. Um, for me, the, the bummer uh, was that it was called Punisher right up until the solicitation came out. The solicitation, when that came out, that's how I found out it was called Punisher versus Barracuda. Yeah. Which is not a yeah. huge thing, but it was supposed to be the the Punisher book. Well, it was and, a huge uh, thing for me, Ed, because I, I did the logo by hand. <laughs> yes. I had done the Punisher logo by hand, and then I found out with solicits, they just plunked to like Barracuda logo from uh-huh. like the, the old. I'm like, if you just told me, I would, which I did, you can see here, like I did. I updated it to include versus Barracuda, but like, mm-hmm. you know, to find out online was a bit of a bit annoying, you know, I mean, you know, I'm not going to like bad mouth Marvel or anything, you know, like they've been very, very good to me, but uh, the, the, the whole, there was just kind of like annoying, annoyance after annoyance on this, which was, it was very frustrating because like, we like the book was making itself really, you know, like it was mm-hmm. great. And like Jake and um, Thomas editing was excellent. And, and I was just dying for this to come out. Um, and like, it's even, even the, like I was, like I said, I felt I'd psyched myself out with the covers, but I felt like I finally, I actually did something where the book would be very noticeable. This is actually cover. No one's seen it because it didn't even make it to the stations. Um, actually, <clears throat> for this one, this one didn't either, but at least I got the logo on it. But then, yeah, the, the last one um, is, I think it might be my favorite one. Uh, didn't make it, but um, I also have... And- and how many show some you, of you drawn hmm? four, four had you drawn four full issues or yeah all of the four all okay. of the four issues and i had i was i was working on the layouts for the last one okay i think i might i think i might have finished yeah i actually i did i did got the layouts done and then it was pencils down um but yeah i mean without i don't want to get too into it because you know i mean no one's seen this and i don't want to be taking the piss of marvel either like but um the, the basic introduction of the story was that Barracuda is in prison and White Nationalists try to kill him. And not only does he murder them all, he breaks out of prison and takes it over. And that's what I've told people. And they're like, wow, that is nuts. And I'm like, yeah, it's totally nuts. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty dark. But, you know, like it's, it's a thing where um, I think on the outset it maybe seems crazy but then you when you see what he does with them it it makes sense yeah. as, as we go through the series uh there's no yeah, yeah, there's no, no, there's no i mean there's no heroes <laughs> no <laughs> there's no good guys in this like they're just all bad but um i remember i had a really tough time well not tough time uh because uh, jordi belair had been coloring all of my stuff for years and this was a tough book because it was the first book i worked with somebody who wasn't jordi um so i was very nervous about it but it was matt uh I know it's Lopez, I assume is how you pronounce the second name, who at the time was just kind of starting out, but everyone would know him now for uh, coloring uh, Matthias Bergara and um, Bill Kiss Avali. And like, he's a phenomenal colorist. Um, and he was really, really good to work with on this. Like he, this is the first book where I kind of did color layouts for the issue. Cause again, I was so nervous about working with a new colorist. Not that I wanted to just tell him what to do, but just give him an idea of what I was going for. And he did a really, really good job with it. Um, uh, I don't want to show too much, but like, uh, sure. this is just so. Yeah. If, if people liked Moon Knight, the action stuff on Moon Knight, then there was a really there was a good bit of that type of stuff in here as well. You know, like this perfect example. Um, yeah, I was looking through the issue there the other day, and I'm like, oh man, there was some really, cool, really cool stuff in this. It's, it's like I've just memory hold it so that I don't get upset about it. Right. Um, yeah. For sure. And part of me is kind of going, going, you know, it is. There's an element of like. Oh, like there's a really cool book there somewhere that no one's read. It's in a drawer somewhere uh, that that we did. Like it's um, it's like when you hear like your favorite director has made a movie that couldn't be released or something. Like there's that's the only kind of <laughs> that's the only good thing I can take from it is that like right you know it was too cool they couldn't publish it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe one day I, you know I still hold hold that hope that somehow some way. You know they'll they'll uh, they'll call you and be like, guess what? Pencils up. Let's get this bad boy I mean, done. But that's it. I will. What I was basically told is that that might happen. But I remember, like, I don't know. I didn't seem that re- make sense to me because you know once you're on another book, then it's a whole 
It is only one issue. It, like, yeah, it would be doable yeah. if they said, let's do it. I could just do the last issue. Um, it's entirely possible, but I mean, you know, but no one's really came to us about it. I, I picked, no, I, I didn't want to show all the, the first issue, but uh, yeah, the odds are, but who knows? I mean, it is nine, it's like 90% done. So right. I did pick some other pages um, just to show, you know, out of context, um, just how it was tough. The idea of doing a crime book for me was great but i was worried it wouldn't be as visually interesting as say moon knight or what have you but um i really did try and push like compositions and mood with this um and like your scripts were really easy to work from like they just flowed really really nicely like it's one two three four five that's a six panel page it's not too much but it worked right. with like i was able to push with like the composition of the page um like getting to draw some of the like the action stuff here was great it, that's actually what was bugging me the other day. Look at the, I'm like, damn, I forgot about that page. I really, really liked it. <laughs> um, really great shadows and mood. And like I said, the whole Miami-ness of it actually ended up being a really cool uh, visual element. Um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that's <One> that. Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. Because I also, um, Matthias had colored, <clears throat> I think he'd colored three issues even. So there's one issue to be colored and one to be, Drawn and colored, and your script was all done. Like, so I was actually working on it. But um, yeah, I I finished. Uh, so I, I'm a file hoarder, so I, I'm pretty sure I've got all the files around here, uh, uh, someplace. All the letter or all the uh, color files and such. Oh yeah, like I say, you never know. But um, I did want to get on to um, what your next book uh, that's coming out that I am also tang somewhat related to because I'm doing like B covers for it. Um, mm -hmm. But it, uh, the displaced is new book from Boom. Um, FOC is Monday, I think. Yeah, Monday, January twenty second. So okay, all right, so it's Monday. coming up. So you can everyone can order it right now, which I highly recommend. Um, artist is uh, Luca. I, I can never remember how to say his second name. Is Ca Cas Casa, Casa La Guida? Okay, um, that's, yeah, that's right. Who we'll is just, we'll savage? I love, I love his stuff. Like he's. Yeah, like just the compositions and mood and everything. Did you know him beforehand, or uh, I didn't. I'd seen his work um, on a, on a few things. Um, he had done a, a boom book called uh, "The Matter of Oswald's Body." He had done. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the series, but he did a book with Alish Cott as well uh, a few years back. Yeah, so yeah, he's yeah, a guy who I. Mm -hmm. He kind of, I, he's always been on my radar and uh, this is a book like, um, so I've been working on this book in one capacity or another since 2008. And um, so during the pandemic, I kind of like, I kept pulling it out. There was something mi always missing that, you know, I'm not sure if you ever have this when you're working on a project and you know, it's, you know, there's like gold, but there's just that, that chunk of story that's missing or that one, that, one turn that that makes it work and that was the case with this we had i had actually pitched it in 2011 and i, I won't mention the the publisher but we we actually had uh conversations the artist who pitched it with me back then um and i we had the, like months of conversations with the publisher and it was almost my first published work but they had wanted some changes and the changes that they wanted you know, as I sort of work him into the story, I just it made it feel like a different story and not the story that I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And the, primarily, it was like they wanted a big bad guy for it. And this isn't really a story about good guys and bad guys at all. And so that kind of fell apart, and I was relieved. And so I put it away. And like I said, I would just pull it out every year or so and work on a little bit more, just try and figure out that piece, and then. At some point during the pandemic, uh, probably like late 2022, I it just I pulled out and started working on it, and all just kind of fell into place. And so I reached out to Luca because it felt like he would be a perfect fit for it, and, and thankfully he was into into coming aboard. Then we just started, you know, we did that that standard like five pages, started going around, sort of pitching it around town, see who was into mm -hmm. it. And, uh, no, I love his stuff because he he's really good at like drawing like regular boring things, 
but they look uh-huh. really interesting. You know, yeah, like absolutely. like I'm looking at the school bus in this page, which could just be a very boring drawing, but it's like really nice. The shadows kind of break in interesting ways, and you know that last panel too. Like it just, um, yeah, he he takes the kind of mundane and makes it like gives it character. You know, yeah, which is uh, which is a real strength he brings to this project because it really is. Uh, the whole book is really just about people dealing with loss and dealing with grief and dealing with this like extraordinary situation that they find themselves in. There's no like big fights. There's no monsters. There's no, you know, uh, gun battles or anything like that. It's really yeah, just, just the monster people. within. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we really needed someone who could do that and really convey that and, and really, uh, get across like this sort of emotional heaviness of some of the scenes. And, and I feel like, Luke is just so good at that. So good at it w- with his layouts. Like you said, his compositions that he, he's just a dream to work with. I love it. Uh, I'm just going to say, um, I've got uh, another question coming up, but I, I'll, I'll wait till we're done talking about this place. But if anybody does have questions, by all means, pop in and uh, we'll, we'll take them. Um, oh, I, there is a kind of a weird, not, I wouldn't say crime vibe. Like I know this isn't a crime book, but like I do like the kind of grounded approach to it. Like, do you think that is a little bit of you trying to, work in crime influences it's not not really but i think a lot of the crime that i write tends to not be like heist type stuff it tends to not necessarily be um like it's not your heat type of story i tend to really like focus on the after like the after like you've done a crime and like, I don't like to do a who done it, but like, how, how do I get away with it? But I really like the, the sort of like internal struggle of like, okay, we did this really terrible thing. And how do I go on being a human or, or this thing happened to me? And how do I cope? And how do I, I move forward? How do I get some, some semblance of life back? And so this is this book. Um, and it's, I don't think I mentioned this already, but Oshawa, Ontario is where I grew up. And this partially mm-hmm. is influenced by me going back there every couple of years and like kind of like the city changing and no longer being the, the city I recognize. But the, the, the crux of the story um, is that Oshawa vanishes, right? It, it, it disappears into a sinkhole and that that sinkhole eventually closes up. And the moment that the sinkhole closes up, everyone forgets that Oshawa existed, except for the people mm-hmm. who lived there who are outside of town, who've now lost everything. Um, and they're just trying to cope with this idea that they've lost everything, but nobody even remembers the things that they lost, right? It's only them that mm-hmm. can remember it. So there are people who've lost their family who are trying to deal with it. There's you know one character who, this is kind of in, a, in some sick way, one of the best things that's maybe happened to him because he's lost a lot of the baggage that he had in his life. And he knows that shitty and he's dealing with the guilt over that. So it's a lot of like that. So I, I feel like that part of my crime writing, if that makes sense, is kind of there. Just yeah. these like really intense internal struggles about uh, the situation that these people find themselves in. It's it's interesting because I, I I moved back to my hometown, uh, but just over a year ago, and um, over Christmas I was catching up with some old friends, and um, you know I I kind of realized when I moved away. I kind of looked at my hometown as if it was frozen in amber. You know, when you're not there. Uh-huh. You just think it's the same and you go back and you just come back to things the way they were, they were. but then you find out everyone, you know, you're not the main character in uh, the, sure. this is the yeah. film about your life and everyone does move on and change and uh, have life. So that's, it's, it's interesting. Like it's not, it's not a Christmas Hallmark movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I find, is, so I that, find I'm always yeah, cool. conflicted about that. Cause every time I go back to Oshawa, so much has changed. And mm-hmm. it bums me out because, like, you still want that Oshawa, you know, that, that the town that you remember. But then all the stuff that hasn't changed is actually super depressing because, like, <laughs> you know, there are these things that are just the, the same way they like they look exactly the same as they did in the eighties, and they haven't been updated. And that's not mm-hmm. what I want. Like, so there's there's no way the city can win with me, right? Like, if they change, I hate it. If it stays the same, I hate it. Um. So yeah, it's a. Uh, do you it's find like for thing. any story you're for any story you're doing there is that kind of maybe undercurrent of like a personal 
I mean, I don't know if it's more, I imagine it's for any story, not just a crime story, what have you, but there's a, you know, a personal true line that kind of brings you to the story you want to tell. Like when I, anything that I'm writing? Yeah. Like, yeah. Or usually is, like, is it everything? Is it some projects or is it no projects? Like do you, sometimes you're just I like, think I'm it's just the gonna... projects, the projects I tend to like the most, there's that, there's that, you know, there's the, that thing that connects me to the story that really involves me. And, uh, makes me feel something when I'm telling it. Right. Like I get like really involved. Uh, I get really worked up about like father son issues or or, or brother issues and stuff like that, you know, and Mm. you can kind of see that in a lot of my writing, you know, like since the salt and sea touch on this relationship between the two brothers, you have that in this place with the guy thinking about his father. Uh, Yeah. I think in a lot of my, the work that I'm most, uh, most proud of, you kind of see that, and I can't get away from that. I, I noticed recently I was looking over some of the stuff, you know, some of the stuff I've written, and a lot of it is like a lot of like abandonment issues with fathers and sons. Right. So like, oh God, am I that obvious? Like, you know, can I not? You can't <laughs> help it, right? Like, trap? <laughs> but it wasn't deliberate, you know. A lot of the stuff is just, sure, it, yeah. I guess you're doing one thing, and then something kind of comes up behind you, you know. Um, if, uh, it's the same thing. thing. I never, I didn't realize that when I started writing, but then I, I, when I was looking back, I realized how often I sort of returned to this sort of stuff, you know. Um, this isn't a question, but I'll allow it. Um, Dennis Hoffman says, um, Deck, Ed, huge fan uh, to Ed, love Sins of Salt and Sea. C.P. Smith is a master. Really looking forward to the displaced. There you go. It's nice to well, thank you hear. very much. And CP, um, CP Smith is great and amazing to work with. Yeah, I, I hadn't I seen hope. him do stuff in a long time. So when I saw the uh, Since the Salt and Sea, I just I thought that that looked fantastic. Um, yeah, he's been doing stuff with AWA, but he, he tends to like change his style up quite a bit from project mm. to project. So it might be harder to like really recognize this stuff because, you know, the, mm. the work of his that I've been shown before Sins and then the work on Sins, whole, wholly different, right? It, it's quite different. Uh, but I enjoy working with him a lot. He and I are talking, hopefully, about another project uh, that may be coming up this year. But we'll see. We'll see what. Uh, do, how that do all you like to stick out. with people? Stick with people that you know. I mean, I know you've done lots of stuff with Damien, and um, yeah, I you know. Yes, I, I tend to be like I tend to get into good grooves with uh, certain people and just be like comfortable working with those people. I I feel like it makes the process easier. There's a lot of shortcuts along the way in in terms of discussion. And trying to get across what the project needs and what what we each need out of it and what you know uh, each issue or, or page uh, how it's going to look and how it's going to come together so yeah i i uh you know damien someone i worked with a lot you know uh brian level michael walsh uh jason copeland he did a bunch of the the early murder book stuff um but yeah when, when i have that opportunity uh especially when i really click with an artist. Um, yeah. Well, also, if you know they're reliable, <laughs> that's got to be huge too as well. If you work with somebody and they actually do the book. Yeah, that's a, that's for like sure. A green flag. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I do want to talk a little bit about, um, we were just kind of chatting before we went live about um, promoting stuff. Like you're, like I'm in the middle of doing lots of stuff for like Thundercats, um, which isn't a book I own. So, you know, I, I'll I'll do whatever's coming my way, but like when I was doing Old Dog last year, you know, I would be just hustling and hustling and hustling and hustling. And with Crater and stuff, it's really really tough. Like how how is it going with the displays? You have a few more days for FOC, you know, that's your mm. window to, to get all the orders in. Like, has it changed at all for you? Like trying to get a new book out there? Uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I was gonna say congrats on like Thundercats doing a hundred thousand that was crazy when i saw that oh thank you. i'm as, I, as i'm telling people i think there's two things that really impacted the sales and that was the words thunder and the word cats i don't really think uh-huh. <laughs> has anything to do with me but i'll take it <laughs> all right but uh for me i don't know it's i find that promo is always like a really tough game and i never know what works and what doesn't because you can hustle your ass off and and you know you don't see the results at the end of the line and sometimes, you know, I, I get caught up in other work and I'm too busy to do as much promo as I want. And then all of a sudden that book does gangbusters. So it's always hard to tell how much effect it really has beyond, you know, the the publisher hopefully, you know, pushing the book out there. 
But I always yeah, so do like, try. So like one thing happens, and then you're like, "Oh, that was it. That's the key. Uh-huh. I just do that again." You're like, "No, it's you've no idea." Absolutely, and, and like so for me, I've been doing a lot of like pushing um, the book like online. I've been posting previews and trying to push it. I've been doing that standard like send it out to every comic creator you're friends with, and hopefully if they like it, they'll talk about it. Uh, I am doing some. The cool thing about this one is because it's set in Oshawa, and Oshawa is very rarely the subject of anything. Um, I am getting a lot of press. So I'm doing some like national TV here in a couple of oh, weeks cool. um, where I'll be talking about it, national radio and stuff like that, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's cool. really funny because yeah. there's a scene in the displaced towards the end of the first issue where uh, Paige, this, this, uh, this girl is holding up her phone because she's really upset. Everyone's mocking the fact that Asha was gone. Like she has all these memes on Twitter people making fun of the fact that Oshawa was gone. And we we posted the first thing that mentioned Oshawa on on Twitter about how uh, Oshawa disappeared and stuff like that. And we have near identical tweets coming in just from random people about how they always pray that Oshawa will vanish and and, uh, and such a, like almost there's one that was almost word for word, something I'd already written in the script like six months ago, uh, which I thought was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, for this one, it has that part built into it, right? Like it's it's a real city that doesn't get a lot of setting, uh, a lot of uh, attention. So I don't know how far that spreads beyond, like you know, the Durham region where Oshawa is, or the uh, the uh, you know Ontario. But I think mm-hmm. it is uh, a different hook that has allowed me to push it in different ways that I haven't been able to with past books. But yeah, I used to um, I used to back in the day. Uh, I remember like, I, I remember like Johnny and I, we, when we did sheltered, uh, you know, I, for people who don't know, I live in Canada. Uh, Johnny also, I used to live in Vancouver. Johnny also lives in Vancouver. Um, so when we did sheltered, we had a bunch Which of postcards. It's a great and, book, by the way. I love you. sheltered. Uh, to promote the first issue, we got uh, like 500 postcards printed and a hundred posters. And we drove down to like from Vancouver. We drove down to Bellingham, and we sat in a mall food court, and labeled all 500 postcards, and then you know did a, a package with the poster and everything to the. So every store got a postcard that we had a mailing address for, and then like the top hundred stores would get like a special sort of like a poster and stuff. Uh, That's great. And but the reason we did that from the states was because to mail all of that stuff from Canada would have cost about a thousand dollars. Yeah. And I want to say mailing it from the States cost about 200. If I remember correctly, okay. it was like, it was a very yeah. like, so, you know, we just sat in Bellis fair, the mall in Bellingham and, and spent three hours, I think labeling and putting these packages together. And I used to do stuff like that for every project used to send out postcards and all that sort of stuff. But I, I, unfortunately now, like I just, I have so many projects that's really hard for me to sit down and do that. I live in Halifax now and to get to the United States would, it's like a, would be like a 10 hour round trip. Like it's, it's much more difficult. Uh, so, you know, I try and do what I can, but, um, mostly these days it's just online and then reaching out to, like I said, creators and comic shops who I already have relationship with. And this time around, I'm doing a tour, which hopefully will, bring a bit more attention. So I'm doing 12 days, I think, and signing right. at sev- seven or eight stores uh, across Canada, like Eastern Canada, the United States. We're launching in Oshawa, where the book is set. So oh, I think it's a big brilliant. thing there. And will you write while you're doing that? I mean, that's a lot of days to be taking off. <laughs> I, I think so. I hope so. I have like, so I've started, I've been doing some work outside of comics for video games. And I have to do X amount per week. And so I'll be trying to sit in hotels and write at night and such when I'm on the road. Uh, but oh, yeah, I was be, just curious because it, it is, that's, it's promo. You have to do it. But also the time where you're not working is, t- you know, it's. Uh, yeah, it's, to- it's. I try to do like I did like in 2022, we did a five week road trip that was like a signing tour slash road trip. And what I did then that I've been trying to do now is I just really pushed myself before. Uh, to get as much done uh, as possible 
beforehand. Yeah. So like I, I would work longer hours to leading up to there just to make sure that I could have as much of that time clear as possible. Yes, it doesn't always work. I think when yes, I, you know, I remember, are, it, yeah, like, I'm the same if I'm going away for a while, it's like try to work ahead. And then when you get back, try, uh, catch up. I have another um, one catch from up. Dennis the, here. He said, um, Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I was gonna say there's still times where I was like sitting in a parking lot in California, leeching Jack in the box, free Wi-Fi and writing stuff to get to my editors. But you know, I try, I try and push big before and after so that I, I have to do as little of that on the road as possible. Um, yeah, so I was just saying, uh, Dennis, the question you said, um, uh, I'm curious in the process when, they, when the book is creator-owned book uh, with a boom or Dark Horse versus Image, do different publishers involve you in marketing at different levels? It's a good question. Um, I've mainly just worked with Image, so I don't really have, like I'm with the Dynamite stuff at the moment, like it's work for hire, they have a system, they're sending me stuff for podcasts and whatnot, and I'll do that. You know, I'm not going all out on the way I would do, say, what I did with Old Dog, but like you've done books at Image and creator owned at Boom mm-hmm. and AWA. So yeah, has there been much? Have you noticed much yeah, of a difference I think, between? I think so. Uh, and part of it, like the, there's a difference. Um, I think like because some publishers you know doing creator owned, and they're but they're paying. Whereas like Image, it's all like a, a back end deal, right? So some publishers are paying. So it's an investment on their part, and so it's in their best mm-hmm. interest to actually have a solid marketing team. And I find that it's changing uh, pretty rapidly, or like over the last like decade since I've been doing comics, it seemed to be like very grassroots edit, uh, marketing back in the day. And now it's like a, a really well-oiled machine. You know, I had calls with uh, Boom's marketing department and there was, I wanna say like 16 people on the Zoom call and each one kind of went through the things specifically that they were handling for the marketing. Which was incredible, like, and it takes a lot of pressure off of me because I I know then I don't have to stress that I didn't do enough. I, like, I'm still out there trying to push it, but I know that mm-hmm. they're out there really pushing it. I've worked with some publishers that don't seem to do anything beyond the announcement, like one announcement that the book is coming out, and then kind of you're on your own. Uh, I don't want like I'm not going to point fingers because uh, I still. <laughs> have to work with these people but uh yeah i've had it, it just runs a gamut but uh my experience so far on the this place has been really great uh awa when we did uh sins of the salt and sea was really great for the promotion uh they were like on top of that they were posting stuff almost every day it was pretty incredible yeah my um my feed is filled with like i just did covers for um the gareth dennis and um uh jason what's his name I was going to annoy me now. I remember his name in two minutes. Yes, Jason Burrows. Um, their book. And I just did the covers, but like AWA have tagged me in all the, you know, not all the reviews, but like anytime they're putting stuff on Instagram, I'm tagged in there, which, you know, I'm not going to share every single one, but I'm like, right. that's pretty cool, actually, that they're on top of that. Because having been someone who does that, you know, like trying to remember everybody who's working on the book and getting all the tags right and everything, it's a, it's a lot of work. And I was actually pretty impressed with that, I have to say. Yeah, you're always in the back of my head when I'm posting uh, to making sure that I I, I tag the colorist. Uh, I always try to tag I'm, the colorist. I'm in the back of, I, I always in the back of my own head, man. Yeah, I try cr- always tag the entire creative team, in, including editors. But uh, you know, it's that thing where you're like, I don't know if you've ever done this, where you're writing a tweet and you're like out of space. And you're yeah, like, oh yeah, man, yeah, yeah. like <laughs> how do I make this work? And luckily, with photos, you can tag people it doesn't take that up helps, space. yeah well okay. also because you want as many in there as you can anyway because because i would time before time you know there was me and rory and the artist uh whoever it was at the time and um, um the letterer hassan and the, the colorist chris um you know i'm kind of hoping that they'll share it too you know because it's sure. just one person doing the whole thing if you're the only person promoting it like having any bit of help for somebody else to share it or tweet it it's one thing actually i really liked about chris O'Halloran. and he he promotes the books he colors, which mm-hmm. is nice because it means all you've got to do is hit retweet or something, you know, and it's not all on you. Um, so, yeah, little little, little goes a long way with that stuff. Yeah, he's also a great colorist too. I, I love to work with that guy. 
Ah, he's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, no, this is great. And it's it's the kind of coloring. This is it. Um, sorry, the that, that's correct. Yeah, and then yeah. Hassan yeah, yeah. is on really the, nice. On like, I mean, I always liked these stuff, but uh, these pay- him and Luca together are really nice um, pairing. Yeah, I think because uh, it's not it's not. Yeah, he he knows how to color Luca well. I think you know because the worry is something like an art style like Luca's, you can't render because it's it's not going to look good, right? You got to go with a flatter, uh, which really works here. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a comment earlier from uh, it was a uh, Luco Luco Kofig, I guess. Uh, who would you recommend reading in the crime genre? Go back to Eisner. I mean, you can, um, but you. I mean, Dave, we mentioned David Lapham earlier. I mean, I think that's yeah. Straight Bullets is Straight Bullets is like the top. Yep, uh, Straight. Uh, I think that you know, like there's kind of like your standards, like Brubaker. Obviously, we're talking about writers. Brubaker. There's there's Lapham. Uh, you know, the older Brian Azarello stuff is great. Crime stuff. Uh, hmm. Greg Rucka did a lot of, like, writers you already mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Rucka and Bendis, their older stuff. Um, outside of comics, like, if you if you want, like, novels and stuff, you know, go back and read, like, the Jim Thompson. Elmore Leonard is one of my favorite authors. Uh, Chester Himes, Charles Williford. Um, Essay... S.A. Cosby is a, a, a newer mm-hmm. uh, author who I like oh, quite yeah, a I've bit. Seen... Who, and, what, what um, have they written? I, I know their name. Oh, my God. Don't ask me book titles. <laughs> I'm like, okay, never mind, I'm, never so, mind. Just I'm so bad with that. Uh, I'll tell you now because I have I have an internet at my hands. Razorblade Tears and All the Sinners Bleed, Blacktop Wasteland are all S.A. Cosby books. Um, oh, I just blanked here uh, on, on someone else's. Oh, yeah. So there's, I I find as I'm getting older, I cannot remember anything. Uh, <laughs> there's a author right now, um, Donald Ray Pollock, who I really like. Um, he's a great writer. He wrote The Devil all the time, which was turned into a Netflix film. Oh right, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. He has a couple of books that that are really great, and he's also like, uh, kind of inspirational because he is an author who didn't published his first book until he was in his 50s i believe oh wow um he was i think a factory worker or something and uh uh yeah and his writing is just it's great it it feels to me like uh like a a, um he's got that same feel and vibe as jim thompson but (laughs) without feeling like he's trying to ape jim thompson like it's not it's not a, a copy but it's got that same sort of grit to it that I really appreciate. Uh, and, and he's someone I try and recommend a lot because I, I feel like he's just criminally underread. Mm-hmm. Is it more novels you get inspiration from, from a crime point of view? I, mostly real life stuff, to be honest. Like um, yeah, I, yeah. I take in way too much true crime uh, in all forms and like TV podcasts. Um, there used to be an incredible book series called The Best of True Crime Reporting that came out every year. I think they stopped publishing about 10 years ago now. I keep looking because my bookshelf is here, but it's actually all my books are downstairs, not my... It's just Do you find the uh, proliferation of true crime stuff is getting a bit um, hawk, like hawkish? Like, you know, I, I love love true crime documentaries, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And like, I'll always the ones... I always, you know, there's, you know, a lot of people are into it because of maybe, I don't know, the sensationalness of it all, but like, I, I like the crime-solving aspect. I like following the detectives on the case and i mean i maybe maybe you've some of that with your with your your dad i mean you'd have interest there maybe but um a lot of the documentaries i'm finding they're getting very the stuff i didn't like is the stuff it's like the killer went into the like it's all very yeah, sensationalized I, and, and, but now now you're getting very highly produced beautiful looking documentaries but are basically the same thing it makes me a bit uncomfortable I, I find yeah i don't i'm not a huge fan of that type of stuff a lot of the stuff I do watch is pretty grim or, or morbid, um, but I do hate the overly sensationalized. I kind of prefer the like just the facts sort of approach. There's a, a podcast Same. out of um, out of uh, Australia, um, and I think it's just called like Criminal or um, Fuck again. Anyway, it's uh, yeah. and it's literally just like 
straight. It's just like, this is what happened, blah, blah, blah. There's no sort of like sensationalizing. And I hate that sensationalizing. I hate, um, not always, but a, a lot of times I hate when the, the hosts or the, the, um, the, the, the narrators inject too much of themselves. Yeah. You know, exactly. like there, there's a, there's a podcast that uh, can cover some pretty intense topics uh, that I used to listen to, but I got so sick and tired of like the host coming in going, this guy, what a fucking idiot. Am I right? <laughs> like, you know, he's an idiot cause he killed 12 people. I don't yeah. like, I don't need you in there uh, uh, doing that. Um, so that kind of, sh- that stuff I hate. I, I, I'm getting a little bit worn out on like the Netflix crime documentaries because they, they clearly have a sort of like format that seems to have worked well for them in the past. And, yeah. they, and I mean, it, there's some good ones all, that I do do quite like, but it's kind of a roll of the dice. You'll be like five kind of minutes and you're cutter. like, I don't like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 they're very really well made though. So you think you think like, oh, this is going to be good. I don't know the that they're well fantastic. made. I think they're just glossy. Like they they no, look that's what well I mean. made. Yeah, yeah, they're well put together. That's what I mean. Uh, but they like there's never any depth to them. There's never any sort of examination of like, you know, what why this happened or how this ha- sort of happened. It's it's all just like a very surface level, and seems like they're they're masters at putting together trailers. Because uh, we yeah. watched uh, uh, one of their documentaries the other night, and we were complaining about it. And then we were on YouTube, and a trailer for a new crime Netflix documentary came up, and we watched it. And we're like, "Oh shit, we got to watch that!" I'm like, we just like, we literally just dealt with this. We literally just got sucked <laughs> yeah. in by it, and mm-hmm. here we are again, just going down the same fucking. Route. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very uncomfortable with with anything based on something recent. You know, like a recent case, yes. and there'll be like some series, and I'm like, uh, oh, you know, ho- hold on, this this could actually affect like the car, the, the 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 justice of this, like you know, like I, I don't mind old cases, like there's plenty of stuff, like you know, looking at crimes in the 70s, I'm like, okay, because you're talking to maybe detectives who did it 20 years mm-hmm. ago, and it's in- it's interesting to you know they remake stuff. I'm like, okay, that's the, yeah, great, but when it's talk- talking about stuff that happened last year or something, it's like you're injecting like a lot of uncertainty and a process that is sure. very, very difficult, you know? So I've got three things uh, just real quickly rattle through that podcast. I was trying to remember the name of is called case file, true crime. Uh, and it's like, it's the very, just the facts touches on old cases, new cases. That's the Australian one. Um, is it? Australian. And I, uh, I'm sure somebody's going to come back at me and say, that's from New Zealand asshole, but I'm pretty sure it's from Australia. Um, the second thing, uh, touching on what you said, the problem I've run into um, is I've listened to two podcast episodes over the last couple of years uh, where I, through friends, had some personal connect. Like, so I, not that it's a crime that happened to me or uh, directly, but indirectly, I knew people involved um, who, who are, you know, families of the victims or what, what have you. And that, I think, you know, it's not something I wish, you know, people to, to actually go and, and experience that. But, like, when you experience that, when you're like, oh, like, I know this person, uh, you know, or I know this person's mom or I know their their brother, it it, it fucks you up. And it, it makes it, like, mm. and I'm not saying that I'm enjoying these. I look at them mostly in terms of like a, a, a research for me and you know, there I have an interest in that sort of uh, that uh, in crime and, in, in, in all that shit. But uh, yeah, it, it messes you up. It, it really messes you up. Yeah. Um, and the thing about that you were talking to about that I think is interesting is the closest to the crime in terms of, of uh, how much time has passed. Um, there's a book, I think it's just called Columbine by, um, oh God. Uh, it's all about Columbine, obviously. Um, it's called Columbine and the author is Dave Cullen. It came out 2009. And uh, I think that is like almost like required reading for anyone who's a fan of true crime or listens to true crime. Because it's a, it's a fairly thick book from what I recall, but 
it really covers like what happened at Columbine, sort of step by step, very like matter of fact, but also how much of what we believe happened at Columbine, how much of that is mm-hmm. not true, how much of that was yeah. informed by that first 24 hour news cycle and has like solidified it back its um, itself as fact in our brains where it has no factual basis. And, and so I, I think that's a really interesting book in sort of deconstructing how we how we look at it and, and uh, process sort of crime crime stories. Yeah, I think I think it's a lot of like historical cases where I, I can't think of a specific example now, but stuff I listened to recently where it's like, you know, once you scratch through what you'd heard about at the time, it mm-hmm. is far more complicated and you know, media narratives completely skewed things. And I mean, that was years ago. Now it's even worse. Like I, I do, like I see a lot of like, um, you know, cases where people are pushing for like people to be released. And then you find out three years later, like, no, no, they should have been in prison. Like it's, right. uh, it's getting very, very messy. And I think that the, that's what I mean about the proximity sometimes, because, you know, um, something that can be accepted narrative from six months ago is hardlined. Um, and then you find out in three years time, it's way more um, uh, complicated than that. And I, I worry a little bit with people's like the appetite for true crime stuff. There's no sense of like, you know, moderation or control, or you just kind of jump into the narrative of whatever somebody's making. I think because it is now such kind of pulp mainstream entertainment. Um, right. So that's it. Like, like I, I do genuinely am interested in that stuff, but I, I try and like have an internal barometer of like how, um, you know, am I getting any red flags here as I'm watching it and then try and, you know, a uh, step away. But interestingly, we got a few. Um, um, yeah, we got really dark there. Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Jenna uh, says uh, there's a YouTube channel by the name "Well, I Never Recover Historic Events," which is very interesting and neutral narrative. I can recommend. It's good to know. Uh, I'm really all about neutral. Like, I don't need you to make out how much of a monster the 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 yeah. criminal is because I accept that, and I don't need to get hawkish about things either. I like. I think it's, I'm finding with more documentaries these days is you can get a sense of the nar- of of the whoever's making it has a very strong viewpoint and it puts me off straight away because you know everybody has a viewpoint but if I'm feeling it that early on I'm I just mm-hmm. I don't I don't trust it. Have you ever seen Frederick Wiseman documentaries? They no. tend to be long, uh, but they tend to be like some of the most uh, like fly on the wall style documentaries. If you can find them, they were very hard to find for a long time. Because he had some agreement where he would only like lease them out to universities and stuff that couldn't be sold publicly. Periodically, they would air, I think, on PBS or in the states. But it's very much like he just plunks down a camera, films. So you'll have like um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the documentary, and I want to say it's Law and Order, but I don't think that's correct. But it was just when one state introduced uh, some new domestic uh, violence uh, legislation. Mm-hmm. And he just plunked a camera in a court and just recorded court case after court case of these people who were brought, being brought forward on domestic uh, violence charges. And there's no, like, they're not, they're, they are edited clearly, but they still run three, four hours long. And there's no real narrative being pushed. It's like this, this law has been passed. This is what it looks like in court now. Watch, go, you know, and like, you can't mm-hmm. get away from bias completely but it feels like the closest of course yeah but you can try and insulate it as much intriguing uh, as intriguing and also mind-numbingly boring to watch um uh, yeah, well that's good because i mean there's a lot of stuff i can play while i'm drawing um i just I, for some reason having a flashback to uh the simpsons episode where uh you know homer is accused of stuff and then uh you know it just it all disappears the, and uh, the, the show he was on hard copy sorry is that the uh the gummy one yeah, yeah, the, the Venus de Milo. But, um, right. you know, he's totally destroyed by the media. And then um, uh, he's exonerated. And then there's uh, um, groundskeeper Willie uh, on it next. And they call him Rowdy Roddy Peeper. And Homer's like, that guy's a monster. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um, was it Gary's, uh, as a commentary said, um, if you can pull up with subtitles, um, uh, Maru in a mask, uh, Murder Among Us from TG4, very victim focused and discussed how the murder impacted the community. Um, well, there was actually, um, I, I won't get too into it because we could be all day with this stuff, but um, there was, I think I've talked to Gary about this actually, there was a famous ca- uh, case in Ireland where there was a, a French woman murdered 
And like during COVID, two different documentaries came out about it. And like I had two very different reactions out of it. One felt like it was completely, effectively everyone pretty much assumes some person did it. And the documentary was basically yeah, like, yeah, he totally did it. And the other one was more unbiased. And it, it, it was very alarming how, you know, two different people could make two different documentaries and come away with some like very different points of view on it, you know, um, which again, I think we should all be a little bit, I don't want to say suspicious, but careful because this stuff is getting more and more popular, you know, and there are real, you know, victims on either side of this sure. stuff. But um, I mean, the most famous one is you could look at like the Central Park Five, hmm. you know, and how they were treated by media when everyone thought they were guilty, despite the fact that they were not. And then, you know, now, like if you look back at, at all the press that came out around the time they were convicted and even up until they were proven innocent, Mm. you know versus what it looks like now completely different it's uh yeah yeah i saw i saw a really good documentary years ago and then the tv show came out about it and whatever it was i just like i felt like the tv show i didn't want to watch it because it felt like it was going to be too much of one like again i just a lot of times i just like a straight documentary and let me just kind of digest the things myself but but anyway we could be on this for forever um, yeah the displaced the displaced is, is that on the <laughs> <laughs> do you like my elegant segue into that that, that um, was a great segue. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much just bluntly shoved it in there you are you are a writer and you have a new comic out and we should mention it again uh called the displaced um uh with art by luca casa i'm sorry casa Lu, Lu, sorry like guida. Do you know how to say his name like guida i was in italy and the amount of italian word names i've heard and none of them really uh got in my head or is he italian i don't know actually yes Luca. Oh, okay. All right. Um, uh, yeah, and it's colored by um, D. Conniff and it's lettered by Hassan. Uh, oh, Hassan. Hassan. Okay, great. Really? Hassan, it's, yeah. uh, it's Manu Alau. I, I've, I've had to learn that one because I did 29, 29 issues with him. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, Boom Studio, uh, by Boom Studios, and its FOC is on Monday. So Monday. I would recommend you all order it now. Um, and when is it out? It's on February 14th. It's out on Valentine's Day. Buy one oh, for yourself. Buy one for your sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. And then you're sort of be like, what the hell did you just get? <laughs> I know it's really great series, man. I love the first issue. I've, it's, I mean, Thank you. I, I knew a good bit about it because I was doing the covers, but um, the, the first first issue is really, really good. Um, I really loved it. But, um, and you know I'm a massive fan of yours, and maybe one day we will and me, circle you. back and... Like- yeah, <laughs> maybe we could do another uh, like uh, uh, cancelled series. That's uh, it. Yeah, we'll do it, future. and no one will ever read it. <laughs> we'll <laughs> yeah. never put it out. <laughs> hey, maybe we have, and nobody knows. Um, but uh, yeah, I leave it off now because I don't. I don't want to take up your entire night. But um, uh, uh, thanks for coming on. And um, yeah, is there anything else coming out at the moment? You said Alpha Flight is wrapping uh, up right now. So I have a lot of stuff I'm working on right now. Um. But uh, beyond the displaced, I think our new Predator series, which I'm doing with Francisco Mana, comes out mm. on uh, February 21st, so a, a week after the displaced, and um, that one's a lot of fun. It's uh, you know I've been writing this is my third Predator series now for Marvel, and I've been able to introduce a, a new character named Theta, who is like a, a she's a Predator hunter. And mm-hmm. so her whole thing and like her family was wiped out by a predator when she was about 13, 14. And since then she's been sort of tracking them down. Uh, she eventually did find the predator who killed her parents. And uh, now she, you know, in this third arc, we, um, she's trying to find the predator. So we know that in the second arc, we established that predators keep uh, people in, in stasis farms, essentially they keep them in stasis to release them on their, preserve planet to hunt and hone their skills okay cool and she knows these farms exist and so this third arc is her and palo uh who uh, who came aboard in the first uh, arc uh they're hunting down and, and trying to find these stasis farms and trying to bring these people back to earth and uh it doesn't go how you know, she wants it to it, it, things go bad <laughs> yeah. as, as happens yeah, yeah, as, in as, these they, as they must yeah um did you how far have you been able to kind of figure out what you want to do? Because like I just, you know, I'm, I'm, my alien runs wrapping up now, um, and <clears> I so, at least knew I had like ten issues to work with. Do you have to work arc by arc? 
So yeah, I I've been doing arc by arc. So uh, you know, I had six. It's and it's diminishing. It's like I had six issues in the first arc, five in the second, four in the uh, third arc. But the the third arc and the second arc page count wise are the same. It's just the the fourth. Yeah, the first the issue is thirty pages. Thirty pages, and then twenty two yeah. or twenty four page uh, subsequent issues. Uh, so Do you it like all comes the thirty page the first issues. I do. Uh, yeah. I really do. I think uh, I think the first issues have to do so much more heavy lifting that yeah, yeah. like having that extra real estate to be able to better establish and to better connect readers to characters um, is a real uh, advantage. I'm doing something right now with a publisher that's not been announced. So I won't say too much about it, but their their deal is usually 22 page issues for five a five issue series. And I was able to talk them into letting me do a 30 page first issue and then 20 pages. So again, it's like the same number of pages they contracted us for, which is 110, but I can really front load all the information uh, that I need to. Um, but yeah, I've got a couple things in the works. Um, I think like three projects at different stages of development. And then I've got, um, I don't know. I've always got like that's, three or four pitches that I really want to get to work on. Th- that's always uh, kind of a nebulous okay. place to be in, isn't it? Where you're like, I mean, I, I, I don't have as many writing projects as you are. And even the stuff that's a little nebulous for me is very frustrating for you to have like a few different things in the works. Does it, I guess you're just used to it by now, right? Like, or is it just I, really frustrating? I, I, it is frustrating. Um, Cause I, I like, I'm one of those people who really likes to know what I'm doing a year from now. Mm-hmm. And comics doesn't often afford you that luxury, right? You know what you're doing mm-hmm. three months from now and sometimes up to six months, but not often beyond, right? Uh, you know, you yeah. might get lucky and get a 12 issue series or an ongoing series that, you know, might last more than 10 issues. But uh, so, yeah, I get, I get really like, you, you know, should have my wife on at some point to talk about like my anxiety spirals about like, oh my God, what if I don't get another book? And then I have nothing going on in three months from now. And I'm, we're all going to be out on the street. We'll just be eating dog food. And, uh, but, you know, I, I do try and keep things in rotation. So I constantly am trying to have things at different stages of development so that hopefully uh, I know mm-hmm. where I am six months from now. And so, like, I, I said, two I, books. I might have... Oh, Sorry, I might, I might have said this in a previous um, uh, uh, podcast or whatever, but um, I was talking to my mum a while ago and about what I'm doing this year, and I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure, yada, yada, yada. And I do, I'm not very anxious, but I do kind of, you know, mull things over. And she just told me, like, she said, would you shut the fuck up? I was <laughs> like, Jesus, that's, well, you know, that's very mean. And she was like, yeah, how long are you doing this? You've never been stuck. You, something has always come up. Like, can you not just relax? And I was like, uh-huh. I, I mean, she, she's not wrong. Like, you know, I've never really been stuck. Something has always come up and, you, you know, it, it's sometimes you're just going to worry yourself into a ball of nothing, you know. Um, uh, but it's it's the freelancer thing. You're always worried about what's coming next. Sure. My wife has said almost the same to me, but in very in kinder, kinder terms. Because uh, <laughs> last time I was complaining about something, she's like, you had the same, like, we've had the same conversation two months ago, four months ago, six months ago. We have this conversation every two months. Everything always works out fine. It's don't worry about it. But like, I think mm. it's partially those, like that freelance lifestyle. And then like, I grew up without a ton of money. Um, so there were always like, I am hardwired for financial worry. Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, and to but feel I, like I think I'm, to be fair I'm though, it's only half a step. I, I think it's the freelancer, that freelancer thing that we end up doing is the same thing as somebody who like goes to a job and complains about their coworkers when they come home. You know, sure, yeah, it's yeah. like yes, she's horrible. Yes, oh god, what did she do now? Like it's, <laughs> it's just part of the thing. You you need to exercise the thing that's annoying you, even if it's the same thing that always happens. It's just you have it in you, and you just need to just kind of articulate it so you can feel better about it. Yeah, and ruin uh, the maybe. lives of everybody I, you care about. <laughs> I don't know that I ever feel better about it. Um, oh, okay, I feel well. momentary moments of like less stress. That it is really just um, me waiting to be more stressed. Um, fair enough. But like, and that's um, why I keep the things in rotation so so frequently and in different stages of development. So I always have like two projects I'm trying to figure out. 
two projects that are like I'm pitching with an artist or or just to a publisher, and then two projects that are being worked on. You know, I I got a thing I'm working on now, and uh, with an artist, and I'm I'm dying to get into it, but like, you know, I'm pitching something else, and then Thundercats popped up, and you know, wrapping up alien, and it's, I just find it um hard to. Like I'm not good at multitasking. I, I'm I'm trying to like carve out a little space here and a bit of space there so I can move on this. But then, you know, interviews come up or solicitations yeah, come up, yeah. and I find it very hard to, um, you know, m- you know, instead of moving five different like um, cars along a racetrack, I'd like to just just move one for a little while. But it's tough because you're trying to move everything a little bit each time. I don't know if you have the same thing. I, I do. I get into that mindset. And like my dream is that, you know, uh, somehow, some way, one of these projects, you know, brings me a million dollars, which is not to imply I'm in it for the money, but just like it would make my life a lot easier where I could just then dial back and be like, OK, I, I don't have to worry about the mortgage. I don't have to worry about paying bills for a little bit. And I think at that point, I would just I would just. I don't think I could ever just focus on one project because I think, you know, I'm sure every creative gets this when they're working on one thing, they start thinking about the uh, something else they could do. And so I like to have that other thing mm. that I could just go and work on and then come like, I, if I'm not bouncing, I'm not necessarily bouncing back and forth in the same day, but you know, like at least I have something else I know I can, I can work on. If I'm stuck on project A, I can just go work on project B. Yeah, did you hear that um, Jeff Lemire, I, I think I heard somewhere, like he just basically works on one book and writes the whole book and then goes and does the next book and does the whole book. And I love the idea of that. But I also know that things only really get done with deadlines. Yes. So I think it's, I, it, I like the idea of it. I think I'd love to do that. But if I actually had the room to just work on one thing, I'd get, I'd get antsy and come up with something else. So I think I'm just, I'm just, I'm just cursed to work like I'm- this. I remember reading that somewhere, like in an in- interview with him and actually emailing my editor going, I want to do this. And my editor just being like, it's not, you're working on three books right now. You have three different artists, right? Like it literally wouldn't work. But I do think if you yeah. can get into a position, I, you know, I think it works for him because he's in a position. He's, you know, he's worked himself up enough that he could put himself in this position to do that. And, uh, yeah, I think I think about that a lot because I like being in the mindset of just one book, even if I'm popping off to work on Project B when I'm stuck on Project A. Like that that's the one thing is I always want to be moving forward. I don't want to be you like I don't believe in just being stuck and then not working because you can't figure it out. I feel like if I go work yeah. on something else and I figure out the problem to the first thing. Um but yeah, I like I would love to do that. I would love to be able to just write an entire series before it's done. But but I will say the downside to that, the thing that you lose with that is uh, that collab- collaborative part of the job, right? So yeah. like, yeah, I know it's an old example, but I'll, like one of the ones I think about a lot is when Johnny and I were working on Sheltered, you know, I think at one point I was like one script ahead and then all of a sudden I started getting work and then I was like trying to do that thing where I'm like, here's half a script. I, I have like, this other thing that's due and, and, but we were like, uh, we had studio space in the same building. And then at one point in the same space, we were like, I would literally five feet away from him while he was drawing and I'm writing the book. And like when I, like watching him as he, at like, as he's working on the pages would kick off ideas for me that wouldn't have been in sheltered if I just written the yeah. whole thing. Like there's a character yeah. in there named Kurt, uh, who's this little bald kid who's a real shithead. Uh, he's, he's like, but he's like, you know, for those who don't know what the book's about, it's a pre-apocalyptic book where these kids think this bad thing is going to happen and they wipe out their parents because they think there's not enough supplies for all of them to make it. And it, there's just enough for the children. And that kid, Kurt was just a background character that Johnny drew in one issue. But I was like, literally like, you know, standing behind him when he drew that character. I'm like, I really love that character. And it looks exactly like the shitty kid when there's no parental units around becomes the most like nightmare child because he can do anything yeah. and so will do anything uh did he have glasses and a kind of a glasses and he had like a little bit almost like a charlie brown yeah, sort I remember. Of, 
Yeah, like, yeah, um, he was such a shit, I, but he was also one of the like really good characters in there. Like he, I think, yeah, he ended he was, up becoming a standout. But that kid mm-hmm. never would have been in there if I just sat down and wrote all fifteen issues because I wouldn't have seen that bit. And I think the book benefited from me, you know, seeing that and then and incorporating that into the book and and uh, yeah, I was the know, same was with the Savage Town. Characters. When I was working on Savage Town, you know, I had the old overall story, and once pages started coming in, and Phil had drawn all these like very like the I'd recognized every face, you know, they were all the like scumbags you'd see around, you know, crappy areas in Nimrick or like there's such great character faces, and it was like, oh man, that that there's so much character that I want to. Who are these guys, and what did they do? And it just sparked a whole other like storylines just out of like a really good character design and mm-hmm. like you i really like the feedback of the art informing the story and that goes back into the art like it's it's great when that kind of synergy is is, is happening and of course like you said that wouldn't exist if you just wrote the thing right and handed it over which is not to knock that style of doing it too i think that's probably got benefits oh sure and it just really quickly I, about phil Barrett because mm-hmm. you mentioned him reminded me of one of my favorite like irish moments maybe where i was like I was talking to you, I think, when we first met, around the time we first met. And I was like, oh, I had a friend who just moved back to Ireland. He's from there. You might know him. And you're like, I don't know every Irish person. I'm like, Phil Barrett? You're like, oh, yeah, I know him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That happens all the time. It's like, oh, I know somebody. It's like, look, we don't all know each other. Hmm? Yeah, he's my cousin. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, it always, <laughs> it always dies back. Um, but uh, I'd I, I say maybe just one last question then, uh, just regarding from sure. a writing point of view is, um, do you have um, like a, a maximum, I don't just mean like from a work workload point of view, but like, do you have a project limit? You know, like I, I found three projects I can manage, you know, hopping mm-hmm. over. Maybe I'm writing, drawing one or writing one or whatever it is. Um, but I found when I had a fourth one, that's where things would get a little wobbly, you know. Um, like when I got Thundercats was great, and I did wasn't sure Alien was ending yet, but then it did, which worked out well because that's just hopped in now to my workload and my mental um, bandwidth. But is there? Have you found a stage where you're like I can't mentally keep all these projects in my head, um, or is it maybe uh, yeah, like I a think- work thing for you? I've been upwards of six projects at a time and that is like no good. It's bad. And yeah. like I, when I look back on some of the stuff, I'm like, I should have just turned this book down rather than, but you know, I'm sure you remember that period of like getting in to the industry and you're like, you can't say no. Cause you're afraid, uh, especially mm. I spent so long trying to get in that I was afraid it was all going to dissipate. And so I, I, I wanted to take as much as I could. I think right now for me, I want to say it's three projects. That's kind of where my sweet spot is, but it's not like three projects straight. There's like, it has to be like staggered properly. And that's like yeah. three projects, but one of them is just about the end and one of them is just starting. So, you know, they're, they're not like three projects concurrently all the time. I like to, you know, two is like, if I could live off just doing two books a month, I would do that, you know, and, and like, mm. it, Two books a month is like, like I can kind of get by, but like three books a month is where I kind of feel like, you know, comfortable. Uh, and it mostly it uh, sages my fear of like, if one of those books goes away, then I still have the two books that I can uh, get by on. If that sure, makes yeah. sense. Hmm. It's like two hmm. books and a safety. Um, but anything beyond three books, uh, I'm stretched too thin. Uh, I'm doing like, you know, like, first drafts and and not being able to spend as much time refining it. Like if I have my way, I write a script and it sits in a drawer for about two or three weeks. And then I come back and do another draft and then send it off to an editor. It doesn't always work that way, but I find that the best things I've written have worked that way. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just curious because I just, yeah, it's, it's just something I've only learned just from doing it. I know how much I can draw, but like writing, it's not just the writing; it's the the tra- having an idea and fleshing it out, and and I always underestimate how long it takes me to. I'll be like, ah, I'll get that done. It's not as it's not as hard as drawing, but it's it's not right. as physically hard, but it's a totally different type of hard, and I'm more able to kind of um, work out the physical aspect of it. Like I can draw two pages, or I can get a cover done. Mm-hmm. The 
the writing is more nebulous for me. Um, but also the benefit is because when I'm drawing, I can kind of let a story percolate for a while. So sure. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting a little bit of writing done, even though I'm not writing it at all. But I have the time to kind of just let it sit over there for a while and come back to it. So it's, it's worked out for me, but I just realized that like having more than three ideas in my head at the same time, just kind of, uh, just it, it, it clogged me up, you know? Yeah, I think I, I get it. And I feel like the thing about writing is you don't really know what's too much until you do too much. And then you're like, mm. I'd like, that's when you, you realize what your limit is and set it. I think sometimes you have to push up against it to find out where, where your comfort zone is. I was just saying, I need enough to keep me writing that I have to be sitting down writing. Uh, cause I do find if I like, you know, there've been times where I just have one book I'm working on and I will take the full month to write that book. Uh, so it's a lot of like me writing a page in the morning and then oh, I'm just going to watch a movie and I, like, I'll go watch two movies, you know, like, so I'm not really working, working. Like I'm still, it's still turning over my head, but I don't find that like, if I have one versus just two that the, or three that any one of them like would be better if it was just one. I think three is like enough to just keep me at my keyboard, you know, 10 days. That's yeah. kind of like what I really like for writing a script. Okay. Okay. Cause I'm, this is nice learning opportunity for me. Um, all right, man, look, I leave you off. Um, uh, all right. yeah, we went two hours. I didn't think, I didn't think we'd, we'd I'd be talking that long, but, um, thanks. Thanks for making the time, man. Um, best of look at the book. I can't wait to well Thanks. i've read it but i can't wait for it to come out and see, <laughs> see how it does for you and um, because i mean I, i've always liked everything you do but it is your own creator own work that i've always liked the most so anytime i see you get to do do more of it i'm i'm always like really excited so um yeah great best of luck with it man and I appreciate uh, thanks it, man. for making the time all right well thank you all right and uh yeah th thanks everyone for popping in um yeah i'll uh, catch you next time cheers <laughs>